off, so it must have moved. But it was in the water, it wasn't on the bank, so it's probably moving around somewhere. Maybe we'll get a view of it a little bit later. Again, still just a lot of bird life around here. All the Egyptian geese, the cratin uh, calls are here again. Um, we've got thick knees, red billed buffalo weavers. There we go, there, the Egyptian geese. There's a blacksmith lapwing. I enjoy sitting at this dam. I was hoping there'd be some more wildlife around here. I actually just need to scan across the other side. I wonder if those fish eagles are around. I don't see them. Unless they go down to the Sand River. Now the Sand River is directly south of us, where we are now. Probably not too far for them. Um, how far would it be from here? I would say maybe between six or ten kilometers. So we've decided that we're going to carry on and, and leave that Birmingham mail where he was. He went very, very flat there and it's quite thick and, like I say, lots of biting flies. So we decided we'd carry on and see what else we can find. Um, I've just come to the area where we, the sticks were left last night. Um, there are some tracks for them going up and down the road here. So we're just having a little look um, just to see where they potentially ended up. Um, they tend to like to hang out south of us, so this is right on our southern boundary so I'm pretty sure they've ended up going south um, into a different area but I just want to make 100% sure um, I would imagine also with all the audio that we had of the boys this morning that potentially these females even though they are the fathers for those cubs um, they might just want to go and steer clear for a bit and make their way into a bit more safer area so um, the last track that I had was cutting south, but like I say, they were in and out of this block, so I just want to check a little bit further along and just see. I don't see any further signs of them so far, um, so I think they have gone south and into the block. But what a show that was from the Birmingham this morning. Eh? He was really quite active. He was moving around a lot and he was vocalizing and we had that standoff with the buffalo. So it was a really, really good show that he put on. Often when you find these male lions, particularly after they've had a, had a kill like they did yesterday, they can often be quite... Um, quite lazy and, and not do too much. So really thrilled that we had him moving around as much as we did. And funny enough, even though I've worked in this area for the last couple months and been right on the boundary of Juma, it's actually, been, I've seen very little of the Birminghams. And so really nice to see them. They've, they've gotten a lot bigger than the last time I saw them. Their manes are really puffing out and they're really looking quite handsome these days. So very, very happy to see one of them. Also, while we're driving around in this particular area, it's a really good area for Karula as well. So, it's also keeping an eye out for her tracks. Um, we haven't seen her for the last two days, all the cubs. And so, I'm hoping that we can maybe pick up a track for one of them here somewhere as well. But it's, the weather's changed a little bit. It was really getting quite beautiful and and uh, it was sunny and it was starting to get nice and warm and all of a sudden some clouds have drifted in it's actually starting to turn a little bit chilly now i see dave's already donned the jacket he's yeah. put his jacket on he's a bit cool in the back there so uh, it is getting quite cool but hopefully the sun will come out again it'll be nice if the sun just comes out just to dry up it the roads again and make it a little bit easier for our tracking. Often after the rain the roads get this kind of hard and crust on them and it takes a few days of sunshine and vehicles going up and down just to churn everything up again. But 
here. Like I say, no further sign of those sticks. I think they've gone into Hoffmans, which is south of our boundary. So we're just going to head back into Juma a little bit. Alright, so we're going to go to James, who I believe has got a spider for you guys. So hopefully it'll be quite interesting. <laughs> hopefully it will, yes. Hopefully it will be interesting. <laughs> now I feel under pressure. Um, it's not the most interesting <laughs> spider in the world, but it's quite interesting. It's a bark spider, it's just over here. I'm pointing with a piece of grass that is waving. You see it, Jandre? I hit the spider, sorry spider. That is Mrs. Bark Spider, I think. And male Mr. Bark Spider will be somewhere lurking about on a tree at the end of one of the sort of, um, stabilized, what is the, uh, leading lines, one of the leading lines. He'll be either left or right. Let's see if I can't find him while you look at the female there. She's caught herself a number of little flies, many of which have been sitting on me actually. I can't see the little male. Now he's much smaller than she is and she will probably eventually eat him. Poor fellow. Um, I'm glad we don't share that trait with the spiders. Here are the little things she's caught. Very tiny little flies and they're all wrapped up in silk. Every single one of them has been wrapped up very carefully and stashed on her web. And I th I'm trying to see exactly what they are. It's difficult because they are covered in silk but I think they're little flies. And she's now basically waiting them for them to internally digest themselves so she's injected her venom and she's waiting until their insides have been liquefied and then she'll go back up to them, suck them dry and possibly put them over here with her rubbish. Now there are flies flying all over us at the moment and I'm wondering if I can't encourage one of them to fly into this web and become breakfast for the spark spider. No. I don't think that was very effective at all. <laughs> right, we're at the treehouse water hole now. Let's go round the corner. The spider has rather stupidly built its web on the game path. And because of that, uh, it's probably going to be run over by a kudu or an impala or something like that and then have to build it again. But she is a bark spider, I think, which means that she will pack her nest up now her nest, her web up, she'll eat it. Isn't that amazing? In fact, I don't think I've told you that before. She eats the web and that means that she doesn't ever waste those nutrients, those very complicated and expensive proteins that make up the silk of her web. She will eat up so that she can kind of digest them and reuse them when she rebuilds her web again tomorrow or this evening. That is the modus operandi of the bark spider. Now Byron apparently is suggesting that I use this, the ivy grape, to rid myself of flies. Now Byron he did this the other day, we watched him doing it in a review session that we did. And um, while I don't enjoy the feeling of flies crawling around on me, the plant here, the ivy grape, is not called per de pis in Afrikaans for nothing. That means horse's urine in not too uh, polite a language. And uh, while I don't like flies, I don't wish to have my face smelling like horse's urine for the rest of the walk. Byron seemed to be very happy to have his face smelling of horse's urine for his drive. He is of course a braver fellow than I am. Ooh. Soraya, are you wondering about insect repellent and whether I wear, I think it's whether I wear insect repellent on bushwalk. I don't. Do you, Jean-Re? jean, jean doesn't either. I know Steph does. Steph has got a collection of quite a 
shall we say, potent insect repellents. He is not an enjoyer of the feeling of ticks biting him. I'm not sure that they work though, because I think that he scratches at his ankles just as much as we do. Now look over here. What we have is the special land snail. Now I'm going to pick it up and I will put it straight back where it was. And I'm going to pick it up because for me, the giant land snail on the hand is like a spa treatment. And I'll tell you why, if it eventually sticks its head out again, I think it will. As long as I'm very, very quiet and don't move too much. Because what it does is it has its radula, which is that sort of chainsaw-like tongue that it possesses. And with the radula, it will start exploring my hand. And when it starts exploring your hand with it, it feels like you're being tickled by the most subtle massage therapist. He doesn't seem to be wanting to come out of his shell. Chandra, would you like to try and sing him the Irish? Shaliki, shaliki, booky, stick out <laughs> all your horns. All the ladies are coming to see Shalaki, shalaki, bulky, stick out all your horns. All the ladies are coming to see you. Look, the harmony wasn't great, but uh, I think we got the idea. Let's see if it worked. No. In fact, it seems to be retracting further into its shell. Apparently, Byron has something a lot more entertaining to show you than a terrified land snail on my hand. Oh, we've got this beautiful elephant that's come out into the clearing. Listen to the hippo. You see, that's why, again, it helps just to sit and wait and see what pops out. Also, um, an elephant walking through the clearings looking for, for Marula. Nice, nice big male there too. We had some fish jumping around, look like catfish. Pratincles all have all just taken off. They've collared pratincles. Oh, now. I wonder if this elephant's going to come and drink. He's heading down here and look at that that swagger that he's got going. He's and they do it when they are walking down here. I love seeing an elephant stroll like that. Watch him go. That head shaking. <laughs> Isn't that great? It's almost like he's walking to a beat. MJ, elephants don't necessarily, necessarily like to be by themselves unless they are big males. The big males, like this beautiful male over here, they do move around a lot by themselves. Um, the, the rest of the, the elephant, the herds, the females with all the youngsters, they are always in herds together. They will always be in groups. Um, it's highly unlikely and unusual to find a female by herself. It can happen though, you never say never, but 
but it's not uncommon to find a big male like this moving around by himself. By himself. There we go. Oh, this is going to be great. Come on and drink, and then I wonder. I think what's going to happen, and let's see what what he does. But I think he may splash the water a little bit, a fair amount, just to get rid of some of that algae that's on the bank or close to the to the the edge of the of the bank, and then probably try and get some clean water. So let's see how, what he does. You see, splashing and spraying. There we go. There we go. <laughs> see, just splash that little bit of algae out of the way. Eli, all the way from Toronto. I wonder how cold is it there, Eli? I'm sure I've just heard of how cold it can get there. But you want to know um, how can you tell the age of an elephant? Now, Eli, it's not that easy. Judging by, you know, what you could look at the size of the tusks, the thickness, rather, the thickness and size of the tusks. Also, those indentations on the forehead of the elephant. You can actually see this male, you can see them, they're quite prominent. The older they get, the more prominent those become. So I would hazard a guess that this elephant is probably around 35 years old, maybe somewhere somewhere around there. 35, bordering on 40, I would guess. It's, it's difficult, and I, you know... I always say to guests too. I'm not. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. It's it's hard to age animals. It really is, and I think you you've got to be very careful. I can give you an estimate of how old I think they are, but I think it is tricky to be very accurate when trying to age them. I would say he's probably actually maybe 30 to 35 years old. I think. <laughs> Look at him spraying the water. Now they can take up to, I think it's a big male elephant like this, can take almost 8 or 10 liters of water. So around about between 6 and 8 liters of water up into that trunk. And then they'll So now with that big sip, they can get a large mouthful of water. Well, they're sucking up the water with their trunk. And turtle tracking, you wanted to know how much they can drink in a day. It'll be a number of liters. And especially when it's very, very hot. They'll move, constantly move around. And if they come across a, a pan of water or a dam, they'll go drink a little bit and move on. Now I'm not entirely sure. I think it's... I'm actually not entirely sure of the exact amount of water they can drink in a day. But I mean, I would, I would guess somewhere between 40 and 50 liters, probably quite easily, um, if if not more. You know that that I would say is probably just an average for an elephant. I've seen on hot days before. I've been fortunate enough to see elephants swimming in dams, much like this one, uh, very going very deep, um, where literally the just the trunk sticks out of the water. And they can be quite playful. What's the, what was that around his foot there? I thought I saw something move. I think maybe it was just his trunk. would be great if he decided to bathe and splash himself a little bit. Um, but as I said, they can be very playful when they get to the water holes at uh, times, especially the herds, the younger elephant. 
I've seen them playing and basically uh, not quite jumping but you know they they lift up and they fall on one another and they uh, it's really really great to see Robin, be you know uh, the hippo would probably just give way of the elephant. The elephant's so much bigger, and and you can see even now that elephants in the water there, the hippo aren't that phased by it. They'll keep a look, uh, I mean a close eye on him. But but the I mean there's a lovely yawn from that one hippo. But the thing is, I think the hippo realises it's a herbivore. It's not a threat. It's just someone, something coming to drink in the water hole. Look at him splashing around there. Oh, <laughs> that's fantastic. So again, I think it's just a case of sharing the water hole and there's no threat or danger. Wow, these Pratt and Coles are all flying back. Those are the birds you can see just coming into view in front of that elephant. But they are incredibly agile. Just seeing them fly now fly very very fast and they very agile they turn very quickly there's lovely light on that elephant look at the tusk shining in the sunlight There's a big yawn from that hippo. Oh, just there we go. Look at that. Look at those teeth. Massive, massive yawn. Now, and again, maybe that is a little bit of a territorial um, show that yawning, possibly the, the, hip, uh, the hippo was a bit agitated with the elephant walking straight through the dam, but, um, but I mean, it's difficult to say. I, I don't know. Uh, from what I've seen, hippo just give way of elephant, elephant and hippo, they don't bother each other, there's no need. And a wonderful yawn, you can see that huge mouth, can open their mouths up to about 160 or 170 degrees, I mean that's almost completely flat, it's amazing. Very peaceful sighting. It's great sitting at a dam like this. There's a Diedrich cuckoo calling behind us. Let's see if I can see it, but I don't think so. It's got that lovely... <whistles> lovely call. Now, I actually think it flew over us because it sounds like that call has gotten further and further away. Now, Sylvia, good question. The elephants are, I suppose, they actually, you would think they're too big for crocodiles and they're not that vulnerable to crocodiles. However, I've seen footage um, and, and I've seen elephants with scars from crocodiles. When the elephant go and they wade into the water or they, they go and bathe or crossing rivers, 
Um, crocodiles, they take chances. It's amazing. And I've seen footage of a crocodile grab a young elephant by its trunk and try and pull it in. This elephant was flicking the crocodile around. Um, and I've seen... Oh, watch that elephant splashing around there now. Um, I've seen elephants lose tails to crocodiles when they go... Yes, he's going right in. Oh, great. Oh, this is exactly what I wanted. Doesn't that just look like so much fun? Let's see if he drops the whole body under. Look how deep he's going. Well, at least we've got an idea how, of how deep this water hole is over there, this dam. Mm, look at that. I wonder if he'll decide to roll, roll over in the water. Yes, look at that. Oh. <laughs> A swimming elephant, everyone. Yes, there he goes. <laughs> He's running. <laughs> oh, that is great. That is great. This is very special. This is this is just fantastic. <laughs> Looks almost like a, a rock there at the moment. He's really enjoying the water. Just had a, a little kingfisher dive down and get some water. It was a woodland kingfisher, so it definitely wasn't fishing. It just went to possibly get a drink. There he goes again. No, don't go behind the nest. Where are you going? <laughs> there he comes. Part of me sitting here thinking, oh, how wonderful would it be to be able to swim with that elephant? I wonder what he's doing. <laughs> he's gone. <laughs> See, so elephant, I mean, he's, he's, he can stand there, but he's just going underwater because he's enjoying it so much. But they can swim. Elephant do swim. Especially parts of Botswana, big rivers, um, and up in Zambia on the Zambezi, uh, you do see elephants crossing and swimming through the water, just their trunks sticking up. You see it quite regularly there. And you see, I mentioned it yesterday too, you put things out into the universe. And maybe, maybe things happen for you. And as I said, it would be wonderful if you decided to get in and swim around for us. And he did. <laughs> this is great. Oh, that is, that is wonderful. And here the hippo. There's a hippo in front of him. The hippo's going to go and join him. Look at that. See, again, there's, I suppose that answers our question. The hippos don't mind the elephant in the water. They're just, uh, they're just keeping an eye on him, but they're not phased. And also, I mean, would you, would you go to an elephant and say, listen, I think you need to get out of our water hole? No, I don't think so. Size does matter out here.
Is he going to investigate the tree? I oh, know. What's he doing? Oh, that is interesting. Hope he doesn't decide to tip the nest over. He's on his side. He's just. Uh, did you see that he flipped onto his side? Mario, the elephants do breathe through their trunk. That's why they stick their trunk out of the water, so they will breathe. They'll and they'll be able to breathe through their trunk. They also breathe through their mouth, but um, but just like our noses, we um, he's able to stick a trunk out and breathe, and that's why he'll often lift it out of the water just to get a breath of air. starting to warm up now quite a bit the sun beating down on us watching this peaceful sighting the elephant swimming if I doze off I do apologize it's just so peaceful <laughs> Craig are you still awake <laughs> for now Wasn't that special? Just lovely, just a lovely, lovely sighting. It's a shame that there's no one else to to enjoy it with us. Um, fortunately, we all got to see it, but I, you know, I, I love guests while they're out on safari to see things like this. And again, I mean, it goes back to what I said a few days ago, the patience, you know, sitting, waiting, and enjoying the scenery, and things start happening around you. I, I do believe that. Bob, that's a good question. I'm not sure how long an elephant can stay underwater for. I think it's I, th I think they can stay under for two to three minutes before they need to stick their trunks up again, um, just for a breath. Well, that's what I've seen. I've I mean I can only I haven't read anywhere specifically that they that they have or that they can hold their breath for a certain period of time. But from what I've seen with them playing and moving through water. About two minutes, three minutes, but then the, the trunk is back out um, trying to take a breath of air again. So I don't think they can hold their breath for as long as a hippo can, for example, which they say is about seven to eight minutes. I've read some books that say longer, but I don't think so. From what I've seen, an average is about three or four minutes for a hippo, but then they can come out, they can stay under four. I don't know, about seven or eight minutes. I don't think it's longer than that. As an elephant, I'm not sure. But I've seen two, two to three minutes, usually. Now, what a great sighting. It was so special to spend time here. I'm going to move on from the dam, though. I'm just going to drive around, see what else we can find. And while I do that, Let's go and have a look at James on bushwalk from the air. Well, yes, here we are from the air once again walking parallel with the drainage line that feeds Treehouse Dam. In fact, that feeds out of Treehouse Dam. And it's a wonderful day out here. The clouds have been billowing about in a sort of post-apocalyptic fashion. Elephants swimming, how wonderful is that? It really is nice. Now, you have a chance to appreciate Jean Dre's backward walk skill. And notice how high he lifts his knees in an effort not to fall over and trip. You will notice also uh, how I will try and walk him into something. For example, the bush that he's about to trip over now. There we are. Excellent. But you will notice also his tremendous skill at avoiding falling over such bushes. He's going to be sorely tested in the next step, but he realized, you see, because he's got brilliant 360 degree awareness and he turned at the right time. There's Herbert in front of us making sure that we are safe 
seeing if he can find any tracks. We have found absolutely no sign of Karula or cubs, and so I think they're probably sitting somewhere in Torchwood. They do go in there from time to time, and I had a wonderful sighting of them in there at one stage. Uh, it was on some board, was right on the boundary, and she'd killed a little Steenbok or something, and they cavorted around on a fallen marula tree, and I think maybe that's the kind of area that they're in now, but we don't know, as I said, because there has been so very little in the way of their tracks. There you can see the horizon. Gorgeous sunrise came from there today, and of course the billowing clouds from the southeast, as I think this front that came through yesterday is probably finishing up now. I don't know what the weather report is for today. I know that it is going to become fairly um, fairly rainy again on Monday for TV, which is a bit sad, but that's okay. And you can see how very green things have become. All the grass now sort of around my thigh height, sometimes up to my belly button, which is about Jean Dre's ankle height. As you can see there, he is a much larger fellow than I. Isn't that a wonderful shot? I must confess it's just great to have this thing from the air and you can see there is the drone commander flying back towards himself, pretty much. Now Connor gets very insulted when we say, well, we're doing three feeds today, which means we've got two drives and a walkout. And he says, but actually we've got four feeds, because I'm a feed. And we say to him, but no Connor, until you are prepared to narrate over your own feed, you cannot be a feed. And that makes him very sad, of course. Um, but it is, of course, important that we keep standards up. And so, you know, until Connor is prepared to narrate his own feed, he's just going to be uh, a very useful extra. He's going to be very upset when he hears I said that. It's such a wonderful thing having a guy like that with his skills and the beautiful pictures that he manages to take. Right, let's have a look here at some biology. Here is the root of Combretum apiculatum, the red bush willow, uh, with an appropriately red root. And what I find so very interesting about this tree as we walk up the root is that it is not dead. Now, this is something I bang on about quite a lot, uh, the fact that trees that elephants push over don't seem to die very readily in this area, and that is, of course, because they have adapted not to die in the face of elephant attack. I'm probably going to fall off this tree and do myself some sort of an injury. But you can see it is in full spring leaf, and I suspect it was pushed over sometime during the winter time. But the most interesting thing about this tree is not what's happening on what was the crown of the tree, it's what's happening on what is going to become the new crown of the tree. If you come over here, there's quite astonishing organism that is this one example of the most common tree that we get here, has now figured out which way the sun is, it knows that it has been pushed 90 degrees over somehow, and it is now growing up perpendicular to the angle that it used to grow at. Now how it knows that I don't know. I'm not convinced that anybody, anyone knows that. But here it is, growing up towards the light. And if it gets pushed over and broken, which it almost certainly will again sometime during its, ex its existence, it will change direction again. Isn't that very special, very clever? Right, Tristan apparently has got some kind of fish-eating, non-fish-eating, spiky-beaked bird. On this fallen over tree. Now, these brown hooded kingfishers are one of our most common kingfishers. Unfortunately, it's just flown away. Um, but you'll find that these guys, um, which this one over here, you can see it's called that brown hooded kingfisher because of the brown hood that the female gets. And then it has this lighter sort of chest area with a few little stripes. Um, now, in the summer months, unfortunately for this kingfisher, it gets completely outcompeted by the woodland kingfisher. So you find in the summer that the brown hooded are far less common and they're often very very quiet in comparison to 
in the winter when you'll hear them very very regularly now the interesting thing about the brown hooded kingfisher is even though it's called a kingfisher it does not eat fish all right it is an insect eater so it will fly around looking for insects frogs um, small little um, crustaceans but no fish all right so that's why it's able to kind of stay here all year round there's always something for it to find um, and so we see them quite a lot so we're just busy in the Mulawati at the moment. We thought we'd take a nice scenic drive. Often when things are a little bit quiet, it's a beautiful place to have a look. He thinks Karula and the Cubs maybe have gone into Torchwood. Um, so initially I was checking here to see if there was any signs of her, but um, but no sign. So we're going to cross over to, to James again on Bushwalk uh, just while we get out of the party because our signal is a little bit bad. Well, here you are again, everyone. And what we're going to do is go down towards the tributary of the great Mpluamati, a place where Karula and cubs do like to lurk from time to time. It is very full of elephant... Um, uh, elephant detritus, shall I say, things that elephants have lit. Elephant litter is a better way of putting it. Lots and lots of fallen over trees here. Let's see if we can't find one of those mantids. I'd really like to do that. On these Waltheria flowers. I have not seen one here today, but I have found a place where the leaf has been folded. Let's look inside here. Oh, there is nothing. Oh, there is. <laughs> if you look in here, I don't know if we're actually going to be able to demonstrate this, but there's a spider. jean can you see the spider? Oh, sorry. It's it's almost impossible. You know what? Before I try and show it to you, I'm going to show you what it's done, and then you'll be able to see it. So, it's taken a leaf like this, and it's folded the leaf over, and it's made itself a web. It's almost used the sort of natural elasticity of the leaf to keep its web apart. And it's made the web in between those two surfaces. So, not in the middle, but between the two surfaces. And... It's running around inside here and then back into its web. Now let me see if I can... I, I don't want to detach it obviously from the flower because... or from the plant because it's then going to be destroyed. And I think this is possibly one of those crab spiders. There, you can kind of see it. Can you see that, Jandri? You can see here, oh, every time I let go, it's living in there. And it's a little green crab spider. Oh, I can see the spider. I'm going to lift it up. Just can you? I don't know if you can look down the tube there. Can you look down the tube? Mm -hmm. Can you see the spider? Hold still, okay. I'm trying to hold still, Jandre. How cool is that? This is wonderful. Can you see his eyes now? Mm. He's coming towards you, Jandre. He's attacking you doesn't like you. We made noise around him. That is so cool. It is amazing, you know, whenever, sometimes we're walking along and they say, oh, we need to come to you quickly, we're losing signal on another vehicle. And you think, oh, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? And then you stop and you find a bush like I just did here and you thought, well, let's hope it delivers. And almost always, it's in summertime, it does. In winter, it's a lot more difficult. Yeah, that's marvellous. Alrighty. I can't sit at that angle for much longer. <laughs> Let's carry on through here, shall we? Good. Now, the other thing you would have seen from the air there, of course, because they can be seen from space, uh, much like the Great Wall of China, are Jandro's calves. And you'll notice, with calves like that, of course, that's how he manages to keep the shot so steady. Yeah. <laughs> few things obviously visible from space. Uh, the Sahara Desert is one, the Great Wall of China another, and Jean calves the third.
quite good. I can't believe I haven't thought of that before. In fact, the Great Wall of China is not visible from space. That is, in fact, a legend. Jandre's calves are, however. You can see the Sahara Desert, Jandre's calves. Those are the two things in Africa that you can see. Right, we're walking through here. It's quite thick, so we're going to be quite quiet, but we do know that Herbie is in front of us, just making sure that there isn't anything lurking in amongst these bushes. But if I was walking through here during the middle of the drought, for example, when there were buffalo underneath every bush, I would be doing this with my heart in my throat. And there we are come through here and as I try and get through this rather thick spot not too far from here off to the east Connor Teagues is filming Tristan at the dam of twins oh I see sorry we, we, I'm going to tell you about this right, there we go we can see Tristan and uh, the reflection of Tristan in the dam wall you see I'm psychic I can tell this from a great distance away and I'm imagining also that you can see that the day has become quite bright you can see that that dam wall was built to cope with a fairly substantial deluge that has yet to actually arrive here it will arrive one year I'm sure and that dam will become quite full and perhaps we'll even have our own hippopotami under where Tristan is sitting right now very nice shot, I'm sure, and you can also see, of course, the great M Luamati drainage line as it feeds across towards Baboon Pan, and that is uh, exactly what you're looking at now. Hosanna's favourite pan, that's Baboon Pan, where he likes to look for terrapins and for fish. <laughs> he does like that little pan. And I'm a bit worried that we haven't seen him for two days, as you know. Because we've spent so much time with him over the last little while, it's quite difficult not to spend time with him. And there you can see the roads, which act like almost mini rivers at times, and that's why they must be maintained, especially at this time of the year, juxtaposed with the green. And roads, of course, in many parts of the world, are major, major sites of erosion. And here, that is why we are so very careful about so very careful about maintaining the roads and keeping them well drained. Right, let's head down onto the dam wall now with Tristan. So, I'm sure you guys were seeing us busy looking around and hmm? we managed to find this Batelier eagle that's just Which landed is? on that dead tree there. Um, it is a immature Batelier eagle, so a young one. It hasn't got its coloration yet. As you can see, it's still quite brown and, and drab. Um, and interestingly enough, it'll take about seven years for that Batelier to go from a chick to the adult with those bright blacks and red colorations. So it's going to take a while still. Um, for now, it's just stuck being brown. And the reason we know it's a batelier is, um, even from just sitting like that, if you have a look at the tail area, you can see the wings actually extending below the tail. Um, so these little these birds have very, very, very short tails. And the reason why is because they are carrion feeders. And so a tail is not really needed because with birds of prey, tails are there to stabilize their flight and to make them more agile in flight and because these guys are not hunting it's much easier for them to just land and, and, and grab whatever they need. But you can see he's just lost balance a little bit there. <laughs> but all's good. They don't have anything to worry about. The branch is held and the batelier is still there. Good. So we were in the Mulawati, like I was saying, trying to see if there was any sign for Krul and the Cubs, but as James mentioned to us, it sounds like that maybe they've gone into Torchwood. Um, I also thought that potentially maybe Tingana might come up, so we just came to check Twin Dams and the Mulawati area, just in case there was any sign of him coming back into Juma. Unfortunately, there hasn't been any sign of it, so we're going to carry on a little bit and see what else we can find. Um, but I believe you guys have had a great morning with Byron and, and the elephants. Um, sounds like they were putting on quite a well, he, that male elephant was putting on quite a show. And it actually, I was thinking about it, it was probably one of my favorite parts of working at Chitwa was spending the days watching those uh, male elephants coming down and playing and submerging completely where you just see the trunk sticking out as a little snorkel. It was really quite amazing to watch. And sometimes when you're really lucky, we used to get the 
the big herds with the little babies and all the little babies would come in and they would also start to wallow and to play in the water and particularly on very hot days we'd get this absolute feverish activity of elephants and all of them in and splashing and playing and it was really some of my fondest memories of being there. So I'm very glad that you all got to see that. It's uh, quite a special thing to see an elephant swimming. Now perched on a little mud or stone in front of us is a little squirrel. So there you go and you can see in its hands is a nut. So what that squirrel is feeding off is a marula nut. Now the marula has little um, nuts inside a bigger um, casing and those nuts are notoriously difficult to get out um, and there's two things in this world that really can do it very very easily one is a squirrel and they use their little teeth and they crack it open and they get these very nutritious very tasty little nuts and the second thing is the local women in this area they actually have a little tool that they wear around their neck and they'll dig the nuts out and they really are very very good at it um, mere mortals like myself and Dave will struggle to get that nut out it's not the easiest process you need to get a blade and you kind of have to dig for a while and we're really not as efficient as some of the local ladies are that are outside but it is considered a delicacy in this area it is really actually is very tasty and so you can see why the squirrels go after it and it's kind of just gone into that tree now unfortunately there's a little bit of grass in front of its face all right, but we're going to go back to James, who I believe has got a little butterfly. It's not a very little butterfly, and I think it's a brown veined white, as far as I'm aware. It's now gone, and it's sitting on a beautiful hibiscus plant there. And the brown veined white, of course, is part of a group of butterflies called, unsurprisingly, the whites. But the whites are many and varied, and I'm going to... Herbert has startled Franklin. Um, I'm going to assume that that was a brown veined white, but it could have been any number of others. Now, jean before you take another step forward in those very large size 75 shoes that you have, I, for the first time have spotted a very special crab spider. It was on this plant, wasn't it? I'm so impressed with myself. In fact, it is here, I can see it. I'm going to get a piece of grass to point at it, lest my first sighting of one of these special spiders be ruined by my own hand. Are you watching, jean -Dre, where my grass is pointing? There is the spider. Can you see him? No? Can you see him? Mm -hmm. Good, there he is. Now that is a crab spider that is, has disguised itself to look like a Waltheria flower. And what it's going to do is lie there and wait and ambush its prey. Now we've been yakking on about camouflage, well I've been yakking on about camouflage for the last few days, and this, to me, is true camouflage. It is invisible in plain sight. That's proper camouflage. And I've no doubt it's going to be highly successful catching some of the beastly flies that have been walking all over me. Um, am I in your shot? Okay, good. Because we are, of course, trying to gather this sort of beautiful footage. And you don't need my knee in the shot. Isn't he lovely? Now, while we have a quick look at him and his camouflage, I'm going to teach you the Zulu word for spider, which is a wonderful word, and it is isi kapu kapu. Isi kapu kapu. And if you're a Zulu speaker, you'll say it very quickly, something along the lines of is kap kapu. Is kap kapu. And that's what that is. I think it's the most wonderful word. Is kap kapu. In Shangan, it's not quite as exotic, it's puma. Isn't that nice? Gorgeous yellow and red spots. The sun is coming out now and it's getting rather warm and humid. So we're going to start heading back towards the north. I smell Amanda's bacon. 
Michael, while we turn towards the smell of gorgeous cooking fragrances coming out of the camp, I'm of course talking nonsense, we're much too far from camp to be smelling breakfast at this stage. Um, you say, why if we're seeing so many other spiders, are we seeing so few golden orb web spiders or none? Um, Michael, I think you'll find golden orbs are that much more dependent on the water and on the rain than uh, the, some of the other spiders. I think also they are... Uh, when they come out during the wet season, and it's only in the wet season, it's January and February, many of the other spiders have been out on the flowers. As soon as the flowers come out, the spiders like that one will come out, uh, the bark spiders will come out. But I also think that you've got a slightly um, skewed impression of how many spiders there are at the moment. I think they're far fewer than they were um, two years ago, for example. And probably about the same as maybe even fewer than they were last year. And that's because of the drought. And so although we are finding some spiders now, there are fewer of them. The golden orbs, that much more dependent probably on the weather, I'm guessing, than some of the other spiders because they're much more dependent on their food sources rather than perhaps uh, secretive um, places for the eggs to be. I still don't know where golden orb web spiders put their eggs because uh, uh, I think they spend the winter underground. And so it's probably got something to do with the hardness of the ground and their ability to have laid enough eggs. That's going to be my guess. Michael, I don't know for sure, but I do know that we're not seeing nearly as many spiders as we would have otherwise. It just looks like that because obviously we're showing you lots of the little spiders that we find. Righty. And I believe a number of you are struggling with the word is kap So I'll do it slowly for you. It's isi. I-S-I. I think it's Q-A-P-H-U, Q-A-P-H-U. And the Q is a sound. It's not a it's a Now, if you can't make the sound, what you do is push your tongue onto the top of your mouth and then suck it off. So put your tongue onto the top of your mouth and suck it off. Isi, hapu, hapu. There we go. It's kapu kapu. Right, Tristan would like to say is kapu kapu to you from wherever he is on the reserve. Indeed. So we've managed to find an adult batelier. So we would wanted to show you guys the difference between what we saw earlier, that dry brown, um, very sort of nondescript eagle, to this adult, which you can see has the most beautiful coloration. So it's that jet black body with that bright red face and those bright red feet. You can actually see the feet now as it turns, and it makes it an incredibly pretty little bird. Um, well, not very little at all, actually. It's quite a large bird. Um, and like I say, it will have taken seven years to go from that coloration that we saw earlier to these bright colors that you see now. <coughs> and I'm sure the reason why we're seeing a few predators, uh, predatory birds sitting on the, the trees is because it was a cloudy start. It, the sun has really only just started to shine um, properly. And so I think a lot of these birds are still drying out from yesterday. And I would imagine that you'll find as soon as the heat builds and we start to get some thermals that are rising, that these bataliers will start to take to the wing and they'll ride those thermals to start looking for any signs of carrion that they could potentially feed on. Now the interesting thing with the batelier, and, and for us it's often a useful tool, is that the batelier will not feed off um, very old carrion. They're normally the first ones to arrive at a carcass, so if something like a leopard or lions had to kill something, these guys are normally there right at the beginning. So they really only like very fresh meat, um, and so you'll find that they are the first ones, and then the vultures will start to come from there. So when you find bataliers sitting, um, particularly if they're with a tawny eagle, then you know that generally there's something there. And there we go, off he goes, and hopefully he'll be riding some of the thermals as he goes. Oh, and he's landed behind the tree. Well, we shall carry on then. I would imagine now with the sun coming out that the birds are going to be quite spectacular and, and this afternoon I'm sure there's going to be quite a few termites out and about um, often after the rain when you get a bit of sunshine you'll start to get a lot of those wing termites taking off from the mounds which will really get the birds into a feeding frenzy and after a cool day yesterday where they would have expended quite a bit of energy trying to stay warm you know being able to feed off a high pro or protein rich source like termites 
nights. They will really be quite active today with those. So it should be good for birds all day today and into the evening. But it looks like it's going to be an absolutely beautiful day. Like I say, the clouds have separated, the sun is out, it's warm. Um, it feels very good to be out and about in the, in the wilderness. Um, it's just got a nice fresh feeling this morning. And like I say, with a bit of sunshine, it's gotten a little warmer and so it feels a lot better. It's always nice to feel the sun on your skin. It always seems to brighten, brighten up the day except when you're in the desert and it's about 500 degrees. Uh, remember this time last year I was in the Kalahari Desert um, on a safari and it was uh, at times going over 50 degrees Celsius or over 120 degrees Fahrenheit by 8 o'clock in the morning. So it wasn't very pleasant to have the sun on our skin in that place but this morning really really nice. So, like I was saying, we still haven't picked up any signs of Tingana or Karula, but I'm sure they will return in the next few days. I don't think they'll be away for too long. Hopefully not anyway. Um, but we still will be live in hope and we'll still be checking around. I'm slowly making my way up towards Biffleshook Dam. As it's starting to heat up, I'm hoping that maybe something is going to go there for a drink. Um, Often you'll find when it starts to get a bit warmer in the mornings that herds of elephants start to come out of the bushes that they've been in during the night and they start to make their way towards a water source. Um, also you'll find buffalo, it's the time that they start going to look for a big wallow that they can go and lie in to stay nice and cool. They would have been feeding during the early hours of this morning and uh, now they're going to be looking for some sort of way to cool down and to then sit and regurgitate and ruminate. So. Hopefully there will be one of those there. Um, even better would be a leopard. That would be really nice. Um, I'm actually going off on leave today. So I'll only be doing weekdays for now. And so it would be nice to, to see a leopard before I go. Obviously is my favorite animal. So any time I can spend time with them makes me very, very happy. But it's amazing to see how many butterflies are flying around. Um, in front of us here we've got a whole bunch of brown veined whites which James showed you earlier that are flittering about in the long grass here. Um, they're all kind of landing on little plants every now and then. You can see some of them there in the shot. They are really a test of a cameraman's ability. They kind of fly in and out and because it's quite warm their uh, movement today is very very fast so they are moving all over the place but it's a beautiful scene as you go up the roads and it's nice and green and lush and all these white little butterflies flying around it makes for a very very pretty um, outlook on life you can see them chasing one another I'm go to Byron and see what update he's got for us I wasn't sure if Tristan has got butterflies because he's nervous or if he actually saw butterflies. Um, <laughs> but there are actually a lot of butterflies around this morning. I think with all that, all that moisture and the rain that we had, um, there's a lot of butterfly activity this morning. It is great. Broad bordered grass yellows. I've seen common vagrants, uh, brown veined whites. I've seen monarchs, the monarch butterflies, citrus swallowtails, all beautiful butterflies. I'll see if we can see some more. It is tricky sometimes, they do fly off. Oh, there's a lovely little one called a sulfur tip or orange tip butterfly. It, there it goes, just in the grass over there. Can you see it? Just follow my finger. There we go. There we go. Look at that. It's an orange tip or sulfur tip butterfly. Lovely. There are a few different species of orange tip. Um, but um, 
but the the general name for the group orange tips and then you get like the i think uh, i think the low felt or the um what are the others there are quite a few of them actually i can't remember now off the top of my head but they're known as orange tips sometimes it's difficult with with um the butterflies nice to see it though we'll see what else we can find there's some others it's like uh, uh, the the butterflies a lot of scientific names and groups and scorpions too for some reason there's no just there, there aren't very many common names just a this is a a, a black scorpion this is a brown tree cro scorpion They've got difficult, uh, difficult um, names. Anyway, let's head back to James on walk. He's got something sitting, sitting on his hand. I think. Everybody, a world premiere. A safari live first. This is a slug. And I have had the same effect on it as it I have on just about every other animal out here. It is having itself a nice, uh, well, a poo, basically. It's having a poo. Isn't it an astounding creature? Just hanging there. You may also notice in the background, Byron. I suspect it was audible. Uh, even without the internet connection that we have here, you probably heard him shouting through the wilderness from wherever you happen to be in the world. Now, I am assuming that the slug, which is, has very much the same arrangement on the front of its body as a snail does, is eating dead and dying plant material, decaying material. It's got two little bits that stick out the front that it seems to be sensing what it's walking on with. And of course the two eye stalks with their little pupils. The two eye stalks with their little pupils. And I'm going to wipe up Andre's shirt as soon as we next go off air. I think this is distasteful having that thing hanging out of the bottom. Let's take it away. Isn't it amazing? And it's not stressed it in the slightest. It would curl up into quite a ball, well, a bit like a pill millipede. It'll sort of crawl up into a fairly hard ball. It's a bit like when you flex a muscle and it goes hard. That's what it would do. So it isn't in the least bit stressed. I just put my hand in front of it and it crawled onto the hand. And I have to tell you, this is becoming quite a trying sighting because I'm being savaged by biting flies on my legs. But don't worry, everybody. Such is the selfless nature of my personality that I'll keep trying. Oh, no, David, you ruined my day. You say you've seen a slug before on Safari Live. How very depressing that is. I thought I'd showed you a world premiere, but alas, I haven't. You are common. Common is what you are. David, you are common. Common is what you are. David says you're common. I'm sorry about that. Let's put you back on the ground. Yeah, I'm being attacked now by it. It's sucking the blood up. I'm supposed to link away there, you see, but uh, that's why I did the theatrics. It's not actually bright, biting me. I'm just going to put it down. But what I can show you is the, the muscle-like form that it's taken. And it's much harder now. And I'm really not sure how it thinks that's going to defend it against the bird that is inevitably going to devour it at some stage. Right, let's put him back on the ground. And maybe we'll find a friend. But we'll definitely remove him from harm's way where Baron would run him over. Baron, please do not run over the slug. I won't, James, but I can't promise I won't run over you. You obviously heard that Byron's voice is so powerful. <laughs> On the back of Byron's vehicle, of course, the loudest person at Safari Live, Craig, the Maltese Root Canal. Batman. Sorry, Batman is on the back of the car there. 
man is on the back of the car there. All right, let's carry on. <laughs> we'll let Byron and Batman go past us. <laughs> Come on. Goodbye, Batman. Right, come on everyone. I can smell that bacon now. Let's start heading towards the north. Of course, Byron is going to arrive home before us, so he'll probably eat everything that there is available to eat. Oh my, earpiece has fallen out. Was there a question there? Highlanders, are there leeches in the water? Highlanders wants to know if there are leeches in the water here. Yes, there can be leeches in the water here, uh, but not. I haven't seen any in this particular area. I've certainly picked them up in mountain streams from time to time. Um, jean I bet, has been savaged by leeches. Have you been attacked by leeches before? Many times. Yes. Oh, not, not here apparently. jean on his exotic travels has picked them up somewhere else. But I have definitely found leeches here. They don't tend to be big thick things like that slug that suck on you. They're normally sort of that size. And you just feel a slight mm, uh, unpleasantness on your skin if you like. And I suppose if you leave them there for long enough they'll suck some blood out. But they're certainly not anything that you find in these sort of uh, these movies where people are Rambo movies, for example, where Stallone is walking through the thick water and he's got leeches attached to his face, but so focused is he on his task of rescuing thousands of people on his own that he just allows the blood to drip down from underneath the leech. We don't have those here. I think Byron is going to give you an update now. I'm not quite sure. So welcome back guys, we're still just slowly heading towards Biffleshook Dam, um, not too much to speak of on the way there, other than a lot of butterflies, which given that I haven't heard from Byron, I think he might be struggling with. So I'm going to give Byron a tip, they're small, they're colourful, and they fly slowly on the edges of the road. Hopefully you should be able to find them after that. Um, but yes, there are quite a few around and it's so nice to see them. You know, last year with the drought, the butterflies, they were around, but they're not really in the numbers that we're seeing this year. So really, really nice to see them. They always add a bit of color and vibrance to the day. And there's just something about them flying around that makes things always seem that much better. I believe you guys were also chatting about slugs and leeches with James. I'm quite glad I wasn't there. I'm not a huge fan of slugs or leeches. They uh, creep me out a little bit. Um, I think uh, many people would be in the same boat as me with that. Um, they're not the nicest of creatures. But I suppose they serve a purpose and are needed. So I can deal with that. So the dam is not too much further up ahead, um, we'll be there quite shortly. Um, there's no real evidence of any tracks or anything leading up to the dam, but you never know. Things can always come from the other side, and so it's always worth having a check. Like I say, it's always a good time of day now for animals to go and drink. You find as it heats up, they like to go and have a look and try and get some water. We were, Dave and I were actually just chatting about the fact that we haven't seen many zebras in the last few days or giraffe so hopefully it would be nice actually if some of them are around maybe they've come for a for a drink at the water hole but it often happens like this in the summer months because there's just so much grazing everywhere you sometimes find the zebras and wildebeest are in these big bushy areas and not too close to the road and so you sometimes don't see them for a few days. It's not that they're not around, they're just not in eye shot. Um,
All right, guys, so it's that time of the day where it's time for me to say goodbye. Um, it's been an absolutely brilliant week. I've really enjoyed it. I'd just like to thank all the staff at Safari Live. They've made me feel very welcome and given me a lot of help over the last week. Um, and it's been really, really a special experience. And I'm so looking forward to the coming months and hopefully years. And hopefully it'll be a really long ride with Safari Live. So we're going to go over to Byron and I'll see you guys all on Monday. Thank you, Tristan. Now, we've got a beautiful bird, the African hoopoe. I'm going to walk you around trying to pick up little insects. The crest is up. It is a wonderful bird. It, it was, when I was younger, I remember, it was one of my favorite birds, the hoopoe. There was some dwarf mongoose around here too, but they've fortunately moved off. Let's see if we can get another glimpse of that hoopoe. Grass is very long at the moment, so for tiny creatures like the dwarf mongoose, it's easy for them to just disappear. And they seem to have just scurried off into the into the brush. And it looks like the hoopoe has also left us. What a great morning! Uh, lovely elephant sightings again, but that one I think that at the dam was just just really fantastic. So great to see an elephant playing and and uh, swimming like that, and then all the hippo. There's a lot going on, and nice to see those lions this morning too, with Tristan, to hear them calling. Now, um, we almost back at camp. I'm going to try and find a cup of coffee and perhaps some breakfast. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it from myself and from Craig on camera. We're going to cross back to James so he can end off the show. We'll see you all for our sunset safari. Goodbye, everyone. Yes, we are now doing a power walk towards home. But if we do see something interesting, we'll be sure to tell you what it is. Sesame, sesame flower. I'm wondering, ah, there are. Come over here, Andre. There are two species of ant here. Can you see them? Andre doesn't like to breathe, you see, when he's filming like this, so I'm never sure if he can see what I'm looking at. There are two species of ant here, one very small, sort of reddish coloured one, and then one black one. And they are eating clearly bits and pieces off this flower, but I wonder if they aren't searching for things like aphids, as opposed to the actual flower. Can you see them, Jondry? You can see them, good. Oh look, here they are. They're actually snuck into the buds here. They're these funny little brown buds underneath my finger. And what the ants are doing is going into those little brown buds and obviously extracting some kind of nutrients. And it must have some form of pollinating effect, I imagine. I'm not sure how from there, though. Every single flower you stop at, you will find some form of life, even if you can't identify it. In fact, if we come down here, there's a little spider. This is too astounding. Tiny little spider, put its little orb web in between those three surfaces of two leaves and the stalk. Beautiful. Right, from something so tiny, let us go up to the air, where the drone seems to be an imminent threat. So 
there you can see the eagle, a batelier that is circling around the drone, wondering what on earth is going on there, in amongst the summer blue sky there that we have. It's really gorgeous stuff, of course, and the drone commanders worked very hard today, so we might have to upgrade him to some kind of actual feed. All right, everyone, that is going to be it from us for the day until this afternoon at four o'clock when the sunset safari will commence. I think Steph will be on foot. Uh, Byron will be on his second last drive, unfortunately. So thank you to all of you for coming along on our walk and on our drives. We'll see you later today. Until then, keep well.